the haunted homes and family traditions of great britain by john henry ingram section eighty two lord brougham in the life and times of lord brougham written by himself and published in eighteen seventy one is given the following strange story which shall be repeated in the autobiographer's own words a most remarkable thing happened to me records brougham so remarkable that i must tell the story from the beginning after i left the high school in edinburgh i went with g my most intimate friend to attend the classes in the university there was no divinity class but we frequently in our walks discussed and speculated upon many grave subjects among others on the immortality of the soul and on a future state this question and the possibility i will not say of ghosts walking but of the dead appearing to the living were subjects of much speculation we actually committed the folly of drawing up an agreement written with our blood to the effect that whichever of us died first should appear to the other and thus solve any doubts we had entertained of the life after death after we had finished classes at the college g went to india having got an appointment there in the civil service he seldom wrote to me and after the lapse of a few years i had almost forgotten him moreover his family having little connection with edinburgh i seldom saw or heard anything of them or of him through them so that all the old schoolboy intimacy had died out and i had nearly forgotten his existence i had taken as i have said a warm bath and while in it and enjoying the comfort of the heat after the late freezing i had undergone i turned my head round towards the chair on which i had deposited my clothes as i was about to get out of the bath on the chair sat g looking calmly at me how i got out of the bath i know not but on recovering my senses i found myself sprawling on the floor the apparition or whatever it was that had taken the likeness of g had disappeared the vision produced such a shock that i had no inclination to talk about it or to speak about it even to stuart but the impression it made upon me was too vivid to be easily forgotten and so strongly was i affected by it that i have here written down the whole history with the date nineteenth of december and all the particulars as they are now fresh before me no doubt i had fallen asleep and that the appearance presented to my eyes was a dream i cannot for a moment doubt yet for years i had had no communication with g nor had there been anything to recall him to my recollection nothing had taken place during our swedish travels either connected with g or with india or with anything related to him or to any member of his family i recollected quickly enough our old discussion and the bargain we had made i could not discharge from my mind the impression that g must have died and that his appearance to me was to be received by me as a proof of a future state this was on december the nineteenth seventeen ninety nine in october eighteen sixty two lord brougham added as a postscript i have just been copying out from my journal the account of this strange dream certissima mortis imago and now to finish the story begun about sixty years since soon after my return to edinburgh there arrived a letter from india announcing g s death and stating that he had died on the nineteenth of december section eighty six sir john shabroke and general winyard of all the stories of apparitions extant none probably has excited so much discussion as that of the winyard ghost with variations of one kind or another it has been published in many dozens of works 
and has been continually discussed at the mess dinners of our army in every part of the world. From time to time inquiries have been made about the circumstances and notes and queries, in the pages of which invaluable publication all the facts of the case have been gradually revealed. From the periodical referred to, and from other sources of credit, we have been enabled to compile a complete history of the affair. In 1785, the 33rd Regiment, at the time commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Fork, was stationed at Sydney, in the island of Cape Breton, off Nova Scotia. Among the officers of this regiment were Captain, afterwards Sir John, Sherbrooke, and Lieutenant, afterwards General, George Winyard. These two young men are said to have been connected by similarity of tastes and studies, and to have spent together in literary occupation much of that vacant time which was squandered by their brother officers in those excesses of the table that, in those days at least, were deemed part of the accomplishments of the military character. On the 15th of October of the above year, between eight and nine o'clock in the evening, these two officers were seated before the fire in Winyard's parlor drinking coffee. It was a room in the new barracks and had two doors, the one opening on an outer passage, the other into Winyard's bedroom. There were no other means of entering the sitting room but from the passage and no other egress from the bedroom but through the sitting room, so that any person passing into the bedroom must have remained there unless he returned by the way he entered. This point is of consequence to the story. As these two young officers were thus sitting together, Sherbrooke, happening accidentally to glance towards the door that opened to the passage, observed a tall youth of about twenty years of age, but pale and very emaciated, standing beside it. Struck with the presence of a perfect stranger, he immediately turned to his friend, who was sitting near him, and directed his attention to the guest who had thus strangely broken in upon their studies. As soon as Winyard's eyes were turned towards the mysterious visitor, his countenance became agitated. I have heard, said Sherbrooke, of a man's being as pale as death, but I never saw a living face assume the appearance of a corpse except Winyard's at that moment. As they looked silently at the form before them, for Winyard, who seemed to apprehend the import of the appearance, was deprived of the faculty of speech, and Sherbrooke, perceiving the agitation of his friend, felt no inclination to address it. As they looked silently on the figure, it proceeded slowly into the adjoining apartment, and in the act of passing them cast its eyes with an expression of somewhat melancholy affection on young Winyard. The oppression of this extraordinary presence was no sooner removed than Winyard, seizing his friend by the arm and drawing a deep breath, as if recovering from the suffocation of intense astonishment and emotion, muttered in a low and almost inaudible tone of voice, Great God, my brother. Your brother, repeated Sherbrooke. What can you mean, Winyard? There must be some deception. Follow me. And immediately taking his friend by the arm, he preceded him into the bedroom, which, as I before stated, was connected with the sitting-room, and into which the strange visitor had evidently entered. I have already said that from this chamber there was no possibility of withdrawing, but by the way of the apartment through which the figure had certainly passed, and as certainly never had returned. Imagine, then, the astonishment of the young officers when, on finding themselves in the center of the chamber, they perceived that the room was untenanted. Another officer, lieutenant, afterwards colonel, Ralph Gore, coming in, joined in the search, but without avail. Winyard's mind had received an impression, at the first moment of his observing it, that the figure which he had seen was the spirit of his brother. Sherbrooke still persevered in strenuously believing that some delusion had been practiced. At the suggestion of Lieutenant Gore, they took note of the day and hour in which the event had happened, but they resolved not to mention the occurrences in the regiment, and gradually they persuaded each other that they had been imposed upon by some artifice of their fellow officers, though they could neither account for the reason or suspect the author or conceive the means of its execution. They were content to imagine anything possible rather than admit the possibility of a supernatural appearance. But though they had attempted these stratagems of self-delusion, 
Winyard could not help expressing his solicitude with respect to the safety of the brother whose apparition he had either seen or imagined himself to have seen, and the anxiety which he exhibited for letters from England, and his frequent mention of his fears for his brother's health, at length awakened the curiosity of his comrades, and eventually betrayed him into a declaration of the circumstances which he had in vain determined to conceal. The story of the silent and unbidden visitor was no sooner brooded abroad than the destiny of Winyard's brother became an object of universal and painful interest to the officers of the regiment. There were few who did not inquire for Winyard's letters before they made any demand after their own, and the packets that arrived from England were welcomed with a more than usual eagerness, for they brought not only remembrances from their friends at home, but promised to afford the clue to the mystery which had happened among themselves. By the first ships no intelligence relating to the story could have been received, for they had all departed from England previously to the appearance of the spirit. At length the long-wished-for vessel arrived. All the officers had letters except Winyard. Still the secret was unexplained. They examined the several newspapers. They contained no mention of any death or of any other circumstance connected with his family that could account for the preternatural event. There was a solitary letter for Sherbrooke, still unopened. The officers had received their letters in the mess-room at the hour of supper. After Sherbrooke had broken the seal of his last packet and cast a glance on its contents, he beckoned his friend away from the company and departed from the room. All were silent. The suspense of the interest was now at its climax. The impatience for the return of Sherbrooke was inexpressible. They doubted not, but that letter had contained the long-expected intelligence. At the interval of an hour, Sherbrooke joined them. No one dared be guilty of so great a rudeness as to inquire the nature of his correspondence, but they waited in mute attention, expecting that he would himself touch upon the subject. His mind was manifestly full of thoughts that pained, bewildered, and oppressed him. He drew near to the fireplace, and, leaning his head on the mantelpiece, after a pause of some moments, said in a low voice to the person who was nearest to him, Winyard's brother is no more. The first line of Sherbrooke's letter was, Dear John, break to your friend Winyard the death of his favorite brother. He had died on the day and at the very hour on which his friends had seen his spirit pass so mysteriously through the apartment. Some years after, on Sherbrooke's return to England, he was walking with two gentlemen in Piccadilly, when, on the opposite side of the way, he saw a person bearing the most striking resemblance to the figure which had been disclosed to Winyard and himself. His companions were acquainted with the story, and he instantly directed their attention to the gentleman opposite as the individual who had contrived to enter and depart from Winyard's apartment without their being conscious of the means. Full of this impression, he immediately went over, and at once addressed the gentleman. He now fully expected to elucidate the mystery. He apologized for the interruption, but excused it by relating the occurrence which had induced him to the commission of this solecism in manners. The gentleman received him as a friend. He had never been out of the country, but he was another brother of the youth whose spirit had been seen. This story is related with several variations. It is sometimes told as having happened at Gibraltar, at others in England, at others in America. There are also differences with respect to the conclusion. Some say that the gentleman whom Sir John Sherbrooke afterwards met in London, and addressed as the person whom he had previously seen in so mysterious a manner, was not another brother of General Winyard, but a gentleman who bore a strong resemblance to the family. But, however, the leading facts in every account are the same. Sir John Sherbrooke and General Winyard, two gentlemen of veracity, were together present at the spiritual appearance of the brother of General Winyard. The appearance took place at the moment of dissolution, and the countenance and form of the ghost's figure were so distinctly impressed upon the memory of Sir John Sherbrooke, to whom the living man had been unknown, that, on accidentally meeting with his likeness, he perceived and acknowledged the resemblance. It may be added that the brother of General Winyard, who died on the 15th of October, 1785, was John Otway Winyard, 
at the time of his death lieutenant in the 3rd Regiment of Foot Guards. Colonel Gore, being asked many years afterwards by Sir John Harvey to give an account of the affair, so far as it came within his cognizance, testified in writing to the main facts of the narrative here given, and Sir John Sherbrooke, forty years after the event, assured his friend, General Paul Anderson, in the most solemn manner, that he believed the appearance he had seen to have been a ghost or spirit, and this belief, he added, was shared by his friend Winyard. Section 87. The Luminous Woman the following startling relation was furnished to Robert Dale Owen by a clergyman of the Church of England, chaplain to a British legation abroad. Although the narrator's name is not given, Owen had the consent of the Reverend Doctor to communicate it in any case in which he might deem it would serve the cause to advance which his work, Footfalls on the Boundary of Another World, was written. It is not given now, for obvious reasons, but the story is too characteristic to be omitted, and shall therefore be given as nearly as possible in the narrator's own terms. In the year 1850 blank, I was staying with my wife and children at a favorite watering place. In order to attend to some affairs of my own, I determined to leave my family there for three or four days. Accordingly, one day in August, I took the railway and arrived in the evening, an unexpected guest, at blank hall the residence of a gentleman whose acquaintance I had recently made, and with whom my sister was then staying. I arrived late, soon afterwards went to bed, and before long fell asleep. Awaking after three or four hours, I was not surprised to find I could sleep no more, for I never rest well in a strange bed. After trying, therefore, in vain again to induce sleep, I began to arrange my plans for the day. I had been engaged some little time in this way, when I became suddenly sensible that there was a light in the room. Turning round, I distinctly perceived a female figure, and what attracted my especial attention was that the light by which I saw it emanated from itself. I watched the figure attentively. The features were not perceptible. After moving a little distance, it disappeared as suddenly as it had appeared. My first thoughts were that there was some trick. I immediately got out of bed, struck a light, and found my bedroom door still locked. I then carefully examined the walls to ascertain if there were any other concealed means of entrance or exit, but none could I find. I drew the curtains and opened the shutters, but all outside was silent and dark, there being no moonlight. After examining the room well in every part, I betook myself to bed and thought calmly over the whole matter. The final impression on my mind was that I had seen something supernatural, and, if supernatural, that it was in some way connected with my wife. What was the appearance? What did it mean? Would it have appeared to me if I had been asleep instead of awake? These were questions very easy to ask and very difficult to answer. Even if my room door had been unlocked, or if there had been a concealed entrance to the room, a practical joke was out of the question. For, in the first place, I was not on such intimate terms with my host as to warrant such a liberty, and secondly, even if he had been inclined to sanction so questionable a proceeding, he was too unwell at the time to permit me for a moment to entertain such a supposition. In doubt and uncertainty, I passed the rest of the night, and in the morning, descending early, I immediately told my sister what had happened, describing to her accurately everything connected with the appearance I had witnessed. She seemed much struck with what I told her, and replied, It is very odd, for you have heard, I dare say, that a lady was some years ago murdered in this house, but it was not in the room you slept in. I answered that I had never heard anything of the kind, and was beginning to make further inquiries about the murder when I was interrupted by the entrance of our host and hostess, and afterwards by breakfast. After breakfast I left without having had any opportunity of renewing the conversation, but the whole affair had made upon me an impression which I sought in vain to shake off. The female figure was ever before my mind's eye, and I became fidgety and anxious about my wife. Could it in any way be connected with her? was my constantly recurring thought. So much did this weigh on my mind that, instead of attending to the business for the express purpose of transacting which I had left my family, I returned to them by the first train, and it was only when I saw my wife and children in good health and everything safe and well in my household that I felt satisfied that, whatever the nature of the appearance might have been, it was not connected with any evil to them. On the Wednesday following I received a letter from my sister, in which she informed me that, since I left, she had ascertained that the murder was committed in the very room in which I had slept. She added that she purposed visiting us next day, 
and that she would like me to write an account of what I had seen, together with a plan of the room, and that on that plan she wished me to mark the place of the appearance and of the disappearance of the figure. This I immediately did, and the next day, when my sister arrived, she asked me if I had complied with her request. I replied, pointing to the drawing-room table, Yes, there is the account and the plan. As she rose to examine it, I prevented her, saying, Do not look at it until you have told me all you have to say, because you might unintentionally color your story by what you may read there. Thereupon, she informed me that she had had the carpet taken up in the room I'd occupied, and that the marks of the blood from the murdered person were there, plainly visible, on a particular part of the floor. At my request, she also then drew a plan of the room, and marked upon it the spots which still bore traces of blood. The two plans, my sister's and mine, were then compared, and we verified the most remarkable fact, that the places she had marked as the beginning and ending of the traces of blood coincided exactly with the spots marked on my plan as those on which the female figure had appeared and disappeared. I am unable to add anything to this plain statement of facts, remarks the narrator. I cannot account in any way for what I saw. I am convinced no human being entered my chamber that night, yet I know that, being wide awake and in good health, I did distinctly see a female figure in my room. But if, as I must believe, it was a supernatural appearance, then I am unable to suggest any reason why it should have appeared to me. I cannot tell whether, if I had not been in the room, or had been asleep at the time, that figure would equally have been there. As it was, it seemed connected with no warning or presage. No misfortune of any kind happened then or since to me or mine. It is true that the host, at whose house I was staying when this incident occurred, and also one of his children, died a few months afterwards. But I cannot pretend to make out any connection between either of these deaths and the appearance I witnessed. But what I distinctly saw, that, and that only, I describe. It is unfortunate that there is no evidence available as to whether this was the only appearance recorded of the apparition, or whether it was known to have ever been seen before or after the night on which the narrator of the above account beheld it. Section 89. Althorpe. Althorpe, the magnificent Northamptonshire seat of Earl Spencer, has been the residence of its proprietors from the olden time, as Baker says in his History of the County. The simplicity of its exterior is fully compensated by the attractions within. Its magnificent library is one of the wonders of England, and its superb collection of paintings another. Since Althorpe has been in possession of the Spencers, it has been honoured by two royal visits. The first was paid by the Queen and the elder son of James I, and the second by William III in 1695 when a large gathering of the nobility and gentry of the county took place in honour of the event. That a residence of the antiquity and importance of Althorpe should have a ghost is nothing unusual. If indeed it had several, it need not be a matter of wonder, as such things go. The apparition, which is connected with Earl Spencer's palatial dwelling, however, is not of the character one generally finds connected with places of that rank, nor are we aware that it habitually haunts the place, but it is so remarkable an instance of ghost-seeing, related to us on such good authority, that is well worth record here. Mr., afterwards Archdeacon, Drury, was invited by Lord and Lady Littleton to accompany them on a visit to Earl Spencer, the lady's father, then at Althorpe. After dinner, Mr. Drury and Lord Littleton amused themselves with billiards, and continued so late at their game that at last one of the servants went to them to request that when they went to bed they would extinguish the lights themselves. He asked them to be very careful in doing so, as Lord Spencer was always uneasy about fire. Looking at their watches, they were amazed to find that it was past two, and both of them went to bed without further delay. Mr. Drury was awakened from his slumbers by the reflection of a light falling on his face. Opening his eyes, he beheld at the foot of his bed a man dressed as a stableman, in striped shirt and flat cap, and carrying a lantern with a bull's-eye turned full upon the disturbed sleeper. "'What do you want, my man? Is the house on fire?' exclaimed Mr. Drury, but he received no reply, his visitor remaining silent and immovable. "'What do you mean by coming into a gentleman's room in the middle of the night? What business have you here?' he demanded, but, unable to elicit any response, became more imperious in his remarks, 
bidding the fellow be gone as an impudent scoundrel whose conduct should be reported to his master. The figure then slowly lowered the lantern and passed into the dressing room, from which there was no other means of exit than that by which he had entered. You won't be able to get out that way, Mr. Drury called out, and then, overcome by drowsiness, he dropped off to sleep again without even waiting to see the result. Next morning, Mr. Drury remarked to Lady Littleton that it was a very odd thing, but a stableman had walked into his room in the middle of the night and would not go away for some long time, adding, I suppose the man was drunk, but he did not look so, and he then proceeded to describe his dress and general appearance. Lady Littleton turned pale. You have described, she said, my father's favorite groom, who died a fortnight ago, and whose duty it was to go round the house after everyone had gone to bed to see that the lights were extinguished, and with strict orders to enter any room where one was seen burning. Mr. Drury's feelings may be imagined, and that he never slept in that room again alone will readily be assumed. But whether he or anyone else at Althorpe ever beheld the apparition of the dead groom again is another matter, about which we are unable to furnish any information. Section 91. Bagley House In an interesting paper on Devonshire Ghosts, contributed by Miss Billington to Mary England, for August 1883 is an account of Bagley House, near Birdport, a well-known haunted building. About this old residence, various ghostly legends have clustered, but Miss Billington refers mainly to a traditional squire light. This worthy was formerly owner of Bagley. He had been hunting one day, says our authority, and after reaching home had gone away again and drowned himself. His groom had followed him with a presentiment that something was wrong and arrived to the pond in time to see the end of the tragedy. As he returned, he was accosted by the spirit of his drowned master, which unhorsed him. He soon fell violently ill and never recovered. One of the consequences of this illness being that his skin peeled entirely off. Shortly after Squire Light's suicide, his whole house was troubled with noisy disturbances which were at once associated with the evil deed of self-destruction. It was suggested that the spirit should be formally and duly laid or exorcised. A number of the clergy went, therefore, for that purpose, and succeeded in inducing the ghost to confine itself to a chimney in the house for a certain number of years. It is not known exactly now for how long. For many years after this, however, the place remained at peace. But on the expiration of the power of the charm, very much worse disturbances broke out again. Raps would be heard at the front door, steps in the passage and on the stairs, doors opening and closing. The rustle of ladies dressed in silk was audible in the drawing room, and from that room the sound was traced into a summer house in the garden. The crockery would all be violently moved, and at certain rare intervals a male figure, dressed in old-fashioned costume, is said to have made itself visible and walked about the house. The neighbors say that these extraordinary occurrences continued for many years. They believe in them most firmly, and are of the opinion that as long as the house stands, it will be thus troubled. Section 93 Betty's Comb House There is a certain old farmstead known as Betty's Comb, or Betty's Comb House, in a parish of the same name, about six miles from Bridport in Dorsetshire. This ancient dwelling, which is still inhabited, is celebrated for the so-called screaming skull that it contains. There are various versions of the cause and the consequences of the malign influence exercised by this relic of humanity. Mr. William Andrews, in his essay on skull superstitions, 
states that with the peculiar superstition attaching to the Betiscombe skull is that if it were to be brought out of the house, the house itself would rock to its foundations, while the perpetrator of such an act of desecration would certainly die within the year. Various changes of tenancy and furniture have been made. In the old homestead, says Mr. Andrews, but the skull holds its place. It is not known when the ghastly tenant first took up its abode in the place, but it has been there for a considerable period. The skull has been stated to be that of a negro, and the legend was that it belonged to a faithful black servant of an early possessor of the property. A penny, who, having lived abroad for some time, brought home this memento of his humble follower. The tradition related by Mr. Andrews, however, is far too simple and conventional to satisfy the cravings of the hunter after hauntings. His premises are not tragic enough to account for such fearsome results. It is, therefore, comforting to learn that local legends impart a more gruesome aspect to the affair. It is needless to enter too closely into an investigation of the origin of the story. For most readers, the following interesting account of a visit paid to the Screaming Skull will supply all that can be desired on the subject. In the August of 1883, Dr. Richard Garnett of the British Museum, his daughter, and a friend, whilst staying at Charmouth, about seven or eight miles from Bettiscombe, hearing reports about the skull and its strange performances, determined to pay it a visit. The result of their expedition is thus told by Miss Garnett. One fine afternoon, a party of three adventurous spirits started off, hoping to discover the skull and investigate its history. This much we knew that the skull would only scream when it was buried, and so we hoped to get leave to inter it in the churchyard. The village of Bettiscombe was at length reached, and we found our way to the old farmhouse, which stood at the end of the village by itself. It had evidently been a manor house, and a very handsome one, too. We were admitted to a fine paved hall, and attempted to break the ice by asking for milk. We then endeavored to draw the good woman of the house into conversation by admiring the place and asking, in a guarded manner, respecting the famous skull on this subject she was most reserved she had only lately taken the farmhouse and had been obliged to take possession of the skull also but she did not wish us to suppose that she knew much about it it was a veritable skeleton in the closet to her after exercising great diplomacy we persuaded her to allow us a sight of it we tramped up the fine old oak staircase till we reached the top of the house when opening a cupboard door she showed us a steep winding staircase leading to the roof from one of the steps the skull sat grinning at us we took it in our hands and examined it carefully it was very old and weather-beaten and certainly human the lower jaw was missing the forehead very low and badly proportioned. One of our party, who was a medical student, examined it long and gravely, and then, after first telling the good woman that he was a doctor, pronounced it to be, in his opinion, the skull of a negro. After this oracular utterance, she resolved to make a clean breast of all she knew, which, however, did not amount to much. The skull, we were informed, was that of a negro servant who lived in the service of a roman catholic priest some difference arose between them but whether the priest murdered the servant in order to conceal some crimes known to the negro or whether the negro in a fit of passion killed his master did not clearly appear however the negro had declared before his death that his spirit would not rest unless his body was taken to his native land and buried there this was not done, he being buried in the churchyard of Bettiscombe. Then the haunting began. Fearful screams proceeded from the grave. The doors and windows of the house rattled and creaked. Strange sounds were heard all over the house. 
In short, there was no rest for the inmates until the body was dug up. At different periods, attempts were made to bury the body, but similar disturbances always recurred. In process of time, the skeleton disappeared, all save the skull, which we now saw before us. We were naturally extremely anxious to bury the skull and remain in the house that night to see what would happen, but this request was indignantly refused, and we were promptly shown off the premises. Therefore, the reputation of the screaming skull of Bettiscombe House remains unimpaired. Section 94 Birchin Bower most accounts of haunted dwellings are connected with if indeed they are not derived from some terrible tragedy the legend of the old haunted house at birchen bower is however not without its comic element as usual gold is at the bottom of the story whatever amount of credence the reader may be willing to give to the sights and sounds declared to appertain to birchen bower that some kind of hereditary trouble belongs to it can scarcely be denied as the following particulars derived chiefly from an article by mr james dronsfield in the oldham chronicle for eighteen sixty nine will make manifest about the latter end of july eighteen sixty nine a body buried in harpery cemetery was declared to be that of old miss beswick whose mummified corpse had long been exhibited as a curiosity in the Manchester Museum. For upwards of a century, so it was alleged, the rightful heirs of Birch and Bower, Rose Hill, and Cheatwood Estates had been kept out of their property by a crafty stratagem, and the burial of the body of the so long deceased lady was to be the means of restoring to the family of the former owners their long withheld domains. The ancient homestead of Birch and Bower, Hollinwood, was a quaint four-gabled edifice built from the form of a cross, and remarkable for the beauty of its summer surroundings. All of it, save the southern wing, was demolished some years ago, but the spirit or whatever else it may be termed belonging to the residence did not desert the spot when so much of its beauty and interest was destroyed. A large barn that is still or was recently standing, and which bears the initials of the Beswick family engraved on it, with the date of 1728, but which appears to have been built much earlier, is the center of quite a number of legends and superstitious stories. Miss, or Madame Beswick, as she is often called, is the nucleus about which all of these curious myths gather. Who she really was would seem to be somewhat uncertain, but tradition states that she lived at Bower House and farmed the estate until old age compelled her to retire to a little stone cottage which stood on the brink of the mill stream that ripples through the sloping front garden. The old lady was said to be very wealthy and when the rebels under prince charlie visited the neighborhood in seventeen forty five she was terribly afraid they would requisition her belongings so secreted vast sums of money and articles of value about the premises the scottish intruders did not carry the war into miss beswick's territory but the relatives of the old lady could never afterwards induce her to reveal where the hidden treasures were a few days before her death, it is said, she promised if they would carry her up to Bower House, she would disclose the secret and point out where the gold was secreted. But they neglected the opportunity. She became suddenly worse and died, leaving the whole affair enveloped in mystery. Here was, indeed, a capital foundation for a ghost story, but better material lurks behind. A hundred years passed away, and the body of Miss Beswick was not buried. Why this internment was so long deferred has been variously stated, but the following account would appear to embody the most popular, if not, indeed, the most historical elements of the case. A brother of Miss Beswick was supposed to have been considered dead, 
but just before the coffin lid was screwed down signs of animation were noticed restoratives were applied and after having been in a trance for several days he revived and lived for many years after this circumstance is supposed to have made so intense an impression upon the mind of miss beswick that she left her estates to dr white her medical attendant to be held by him as long as her body was kept above the ground the doctor embalmed the body and was thus enabled to keep it unburied and so withhold the property from the long expectant descendants of the beswick family whatever may be fact and what fiction about this tradition is not in our power to say but the following extract from the manchester guardian of saturday august fifteenth eighteen sixty eight is certainly confirmatory of some portions of the popular account a curious interment on the twenty second of july were committed to the earth in the hoppery cemetery the remains of miss beswick removed from the peter street museum there is a tradition that this lady who is supposed to have died about one hundred years ago had acquired so strong a fear of being buried alive that she left certain property to her medical attendant so long so the story runs as she should be kept above the ground the doctor seems to have embalmed the body with tar and then swathed it with a strong bandage leaving the face exposed and to have kept her out of the grave as long as he could for many years past the mummy has been lodged in the rooms of manchester natural history society where it has long been an object of much popular interest it seems that the commissioners who are charged with the rearrangement of the society's collections have deemed this specimen undesirable and have at last buried it one of the curious arrangements tradition asserts miss peswick bargained for was that every twenty-one years her body should be brought to birch and bower and remain there for one week and old folks who should know about it declare that the body was taken there at the stipulated times and put in the granary of the old farmstead thus far nothing beyond the eccentricity of humanity has been cited but the eccentricities of a supernatural being have now to be referred to in the morning state these authorities when the corpse was fetched the horses and cows were always found let loose and sometimes a cow would be found up in the hayloft although how it came there was indeed a mystery as there was no passage large enough to admit a beast of such magnitude the last prank of this description played by miss beswick so far as our information goes was a few years ago when a cow belonging to the farmer then tenanting the place was found on the hayloft and it was the firm belief of many thereabouts that supernatural agency had been employed to place it there what made it particularly ominous was the fact that it was the fourteenth anniversary of seven years since miss beswick died and it was a well-established fact that something supernatural happened or was seen at the expiration of every seven years at birch and bower how the cow got up there was a mystery to everyone whilst that blocks had to be borrowed from bower mill to let it down through the hay hole outside the barn was an equally well-known fact after miss beswick's death her old house was divided into several dwellings and many strange stories are rife of the marvellous things therein seen and heard one family had grown so familiar with the apparition of the old lady in the silken gown that they were in no way alarmed when she appeared sometimes when they were seated at supper a rustling of silk would be heard at the front entrance and presently a lady arrayed in black silk would glide through the room walk straight into the parlor and then disappear at one particular flagstone 
it was a harmless spirit annoying no one and her appearance never drew forth any further remarks from the family than hush the old lady comes again in another part of the dwelling an inmate had a treadle lathe for wood turning which he used after his day's work was over in doing petty jobs of joinery for the neighbors sometimes when he went into his little workroom an invisible visitor would be working away with the lathe in full motion it was now about eighty-five years since the almost forgotten barley times made sad oppression amongst the poor people of this country protection had nearly ruined the nation flour was at a fearful price and good bread scarcely obtainable as a body of the hand-loom weavers were starving for want of food but one of them joe at tamers made such large purchases and seemed so flush of money that everybody was puzzled it was well known that joe had a large family of small children who were supposed to depend for their daily bread upon his labors with the shuttle and yet it was clear that they were stinted neither in food nor clothing joe lived in one wing of birch and bower house and it was whispered that he had found the gold which had been hidden by madame beswick years passed away before the source of joe's wealth was discovered but eventually he confessed that he had pulled up the floor of the haunted parlor intending to put up a loom for one of his children to learn to weave and in digging the treadle hole he found a tin vessel filled with gold wedges each valued at three pounds ten shillings he never mentioned the circumstance to any one at the time but took his finds to oliphant's in st anne's square manchester and got it changed into current coin people were still living a few years ago who knew joe at tamers and the tin vessel in which he found the gold is said to still be preserved by his descendants it was thought that the discovery of her hidden treasure would break the spell and that madame beswick's troubled spirit would now rest but this is not the case some few years ago she was seen near the old well by the brookside when a presumed heir of the estates was pressing his claim a rustic was going to fetch a pail of water but when he got to the well he beheld a tall lady standing by it wearing a black silk gown and a white cap with a frilled border of those stiff old-fashioned puffs which were formerly worn she stood there in the dusk in a defiant or threatening attitude streams of blue light seeming to dart from her eyes and flash on the horror-stricken man this appearance of the lady's apparition was considered as a token that she would get no rest until the estates had reverted to the real heir in the light of hitherto want of success of the beswicks to regain the property notwithstanding their frequent efforts the old lady's spirit appears doomed for a very lengthy and uncertain space of time to walk the earth madame beswick indeed still haunts the old neighborhood on clear moonlit nights she walks in a headless state between the old barn and the horse pool and at other times assumes the forms of different animals but is always lost sight of near the horse pool this causes some folk to fancy that she concealed something there during the scottish invasion which she is now desirous of pointing out to any one courageous enough to speak to her on dark and dreary winter nights the barn it is said appears to be on fire a red glare of glowing heat being observable through the loopholes and crevices of the building and strange unearthly noises proceed from it as if satan and all his imps were holding jubilee there sometimes indeed the sight is so threatening that the neighbors will raise an alarm and knock up the farmer and tell him the barn is in flames when the premises are searched however nothing is found wrong everything is in order and the neighbors go terror-stricken home fully convinced that they have witnessed another of madame beswick's supernatural pranks section ninety five 
Black Adam. The belief in headless specters of not only human, but equine and canine beings, is very widely spread throughout England, as readers of Charles Hardwick's Traditions and other kindred works are well aware. In the western counties, the myth is frequently localized, as at Plymouth where Sir Francis Drake has been seen driving a hearse drawn by headless horses and followed by a pack of headless hounds. In Cornwall, such apparitions are quite common, one of the most noted being that told by the Reverend Thistleton Dryer in One and All. The Reverend Richard Dodge, early in the last century, vicar of Tolland near Lew in Cornwall, like several other Cornish clergymen, was very eccentric. His singularities impressed the surrounding peasantry with a great awe of him, and to meet him on the highway after dark inspired, it was averred, the utmost consternation and terror. At that lonesome time, he was believed to drive along the evil spirits, some of whom were visible in various sorts of shapes and pursue them with his whip in a most audacious manner. Not unfrequently, too, he would be seen in the churchyard at midnight to the great horror of passers-by. As an exorcist, Mr. Dodge had a great reputation. He was supposed to be deeply versed in the black art and able not only to raise ghosts, but to lay them in the Red Sea or other convenient resting place by a nod of his head. A truly useful clergyman for the time and locality, although indeed his fame was not confined to his own parish, nor limited to the age in which he lived. One day, a messenger arrived at his house with a note from Mr. Mills, rector of Lanreath, to this effect. On divers occasions has the laborer returning from his work across the moor been frightened nigh into lunacy by sounds and sights of very dreadful character. The appearance is said to be that of a man, habited in black, driving a carriage drawn by headless horses. My present business is to ask your assistance in this matter, either to reassure the minds of the country people, if it only be a simple terror, or, if there be any truth in it, to set the troubled spirit of the man at rest. This was quite sufficient to put a man of Mr. Dodge's temperament upon his mettle. The next night, accompanied by Mr. Mills, he set out to visit the haunted locality. But, although the night was dark and murky, they could catch no glimpse of the ghostly driver and hear only the occasional howling of dogs belonging to distant farmhouses, or else the melancholy wailing of the wind as it soughed across the moor. After some long time, the clergyman became wearied of waiting, and decided that it was useless to watch any longer then. But they agreed to meet again at some other night in hopes of meeting the specter. They separated, Mr. Dodge for the vicarage at Talland, and Mr. Mills for his rectory at Lanreath. Mr. Dodge had not proceeded far before his steed became excessively restive, and, although he applied whip and spur, the beast grew most uneasy, pricked up its ears, snorted and swerved from side to side of the road, as if something stood in the path before it. This continued for some time until Mr. Dodge, thinking it dangerous to attempt to pursue his journey, threw the reins on the neck of the horse, when it immediately started back towards the moor, and with immense rapidity carried him to the spot where he had parted from his companion. On nearing this place, the horse seemed seized with incontrollable fury, and the vicar was horrified to behold Mr. Mills, prostrate on the ground, and by his side the much dreaded specter of the black coach and the headless horses. Jumping down to the assistance of his insensible friend, Mr. Dodge raised his lips in prayer when, instantly the specter screamed, Dodge is come! I must be gone! 
and leaped into his chariot, whipping furiously the headless horses and vanishing into the darkness of the night. The rector's horse, which had taken flight on beholding its own headless kith and kin, galloped off homewards at a terrible rate. The sound of its hoofs as it dashed madly through the quiet little village aroused the cottagers, who, deeming their clergyman had been thrown and perhaps killed, turned out in body to seek for him. On arriving at Black Adden, they discovered their rector, supported by Mr. Dodge, but in an insensible condition. They escorted him home, and in a few days, much to the satisfaction of everybody, he recovered completely from the ill effects of his severe fright and fall. Curious to relate from that time, nothing has been seen or heard of this ghost and its headless horses driving over that moor. Section 96 Black Hedden Black Hedden, a quiet village near Stamfordham in Northumberland, acquired an unenviable notoriety some fifty years or so ago on account of a troublesome specter by which it was haunted. The supernatural being, whose pranks so disturbed this picturesque but secluded place, was known as Silky, on account of its silken and rustling attire. It is a strange but by no means unparalleled circumstance that spirits bearing the same name and endowed with similar characteristics have rendered untenable the once famed manor house of Churton, as well as many other ancient English dwellings. Although Richardson, in his table book of traditions, asserts that Silky has now disappeared from Blackheaden and has seized her manifold methods of annoying its inhabitants, this scarcely seems borne out by facts, if our information may be relied on. The tradition of her vagaries was too deeply impressed upon the locality to be quite eradicated in one generation or so. Silky, although occasionally manifesting herself or itself in various shapes and ways, has a marked predilection for making herself visible in the semblance of a female dressed in silken attire. Many a time, when one of the more timorous of the community had a night journey to perform, has he, unawares and invisibly, been dogged and watched by this spectral tormentor, who, at the dreariest part of the road, the most suitable for thrilling surprises, would suddenly break forth in dazzling splendor? If the person happened to be on horseback, a sort of exercise for which Silky evinced a strong partiality, she would unexpectedly seat herself behind him, rattling in her silks. Then, after the enjoyment of a comfortable ride, with instantaneous abruptness, she would dissolve into thin air, leaving the bewildered horseman in blank amazement. At Belsey, two or three miles from Blackheaden, the spectre had a favorite resort. It was a romantic crag, finely studded with trees, under the gloomy shadow of which she loved to wander all the livelong night. Here often has the belated peasant beheld her dimly through the somber twilight, as if engaged in splitting great stones, or hewing with many a stroke some stately monarch of the grove. Whilst he thus stood and gazed, he would suddenly hear the howling of a resistless tempest rushing through the woodland, while to the eye not a leaf was seen to quiver, nor a spray to bend. The bottom of this crag is washed by a picturesque lake or fish pond, at whose outlet is a waterfall, over which a venerable tree, sweeping its shadowy arms, adds to the impressiveness of the scene. Amid the complicated and contorted limbs of this tree, Silky possessed a rude chair, where she was wont, in her moodier moments, to sit, rocked by the winds, enjoying the rustling of the storm through the woods, or the rush of the cascade through the pauses of the gale. This tree, so consecrated by the terrors of the vicinity, was carefully preserved through the care of the late proprietor, Sir Charles M. L. Monk, Baronet, of Belsey Castle, and though no longer tenanted by its ghostly visitant, it yet spreads majestically its time-hallowed canopy over the mysterious spot. 
and still, in memory of its spectral occupant, bears the name of Silky's Seat. Silky exercised a marvelous influence over the brute creation. Horses, which would appear to possess a discernment of spirits superior to man, at least are more sharp-sighted in the dark, were in an extraordinary degree sensitive to her presence and control. Having once perceived the effects of her power, she seems to have had a perverse pleasure in meddling with and arresting them in the midst of their labors. When this misfortune occurred, there was no ordinary remedy brute force could devise to make the restive beast resume the proper and intended direction. Expostulation, soothing, whipping, and kicking were all exerted in vain. The ultimate resource, unless it might be her whim to revoke the spell in the interim, was witchwood or rowan tree, an antidote of unfailing efficacy in these as in all similar cases. One night, an unfortunate farm servant was the selected victim of her mischievous frolics. He had to go to a colliery at some distance for coals, and it was late in the evening before he could return. Silky waylaid him at a bridge, henceforth called Silky's Brig, lying a little to the south of Blackheadon, on the road between that place and Stamfordham. Just as he had arrived at the height of that bad eminence, the keystone, horses, and cart became fixed and immovable, and in that melancholy plight might man and beast have continued, quaking, sweating, and paralyzed, till morning light, had not a neighboring servant come up opportunely to the rescue, carrying some of the potent witchwood with him. On the arrival of this seasonable aid, the charm was effectually broken, and in a short time both man and coals reached home in safety. Silky was wayward and capricious, but at length her erratic course came to an end. She abruptly disappeared. It had been long surmised by those who paid attention to the matter that she was the troubled phantom of some person who had died miserably in consequence of being overtaken by mortal agony before she was able to disclose the whereabouts of a great treasure she was in possession of and on that account could not lie still in her grave. About the period referred to, a domestic female servant, being alone in one of the rooms of a house at Blackheadon, was frightfully alarmed by the ceiling above suddenly giving way, and the dropping from it with a prodigious clash of something black, shapeless, and uncouth. The servant did not stop to scrutinize an object so hideous and startling, but fled to her mistress, screaming at the pitch of her voice, The devil's in the house! The devil's in the house! He's come through the ceiling! With this terrible announcement, the whole family were speedily convoked, and great was their consternation at the idea of the foe of mankind being amongst them in a visible form. In this appalling extremity, a considerable time elapsed before anyone could brace up courage to face the enemy or be prevailed on to go and inspect the cause of the alarm. At last the mistress, who happened to be the most stout-hearted, ventured into the room, when, instead of the personage on whose account such awful apprehensions were entertained, a great dog-skin lay on the floor, black and hideous enough, forsooth, but filled with gold. The house where this occurred was, at the time, occupied by the Heppels, respectable yeomen of the place. Their descendants were still the proprietors of it in 1844, and, it is said, had acquired a very considerable sum from Silky's long-hidden treasure. After this, Silky was neither seen nor heard, is the opinion of the narrator of the above circumstances. Her destiny was accomplished, her spirit laid, and she now, according to this informant, sleeps as peacefully and unperturbed as the degenerate and unenterprising ghosts of more recent time.